Uh, I'd really like to thank her for coming. This is Professor Hong Hua, who's a very well-respected and very uh, well-liked professor at, uh, at Arizona. And she's been working for many years across optics and, and photonics. And her work most recently, uh, of course, is in head-mounted displays and is very well known in that regard. So please, let's uh, welcome her back for a discussion that, if I understand correctly, will be more on the analytical side uh, of things this time. Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, sampling requirements for 3D live field display. So as we all know that uh, and head worn display has become an increasingly interesting and important in the field of AR and VR. And there are lots of HMDs has been developed, and some of them and are commercially available today. But most of them, actually, I should say all of them commercially available are based on the same simple schematics, where you have a macro display, and then the macro, then you have a lens later, you have an eyepiece. The eyepiece then magnify the dis image on the macro display so that your eye can see. So because the eyepiece typically does not have the ability to change the optical power, therefore the image formed by the eyepiece it, to the eye appears to be a virtual display located at a fixed distance. So this problem has been known, very well known these days in the community, and, and because, they, because the display does not have the capability to render correct focusing cues. So therefore, it is related to the virgin's accommodation mismatch problem, and is documented to cause a good amount of problems. So there are lots of research work has been done in the area trying to address the focus cue problem. And then a couple, in the earlier last year, I wrote an article summarized what are the different methodology that people have applied and compare them. If you're interested, you read that paper. But today I'm mainly going to look at one thing. So in general, there are probably five different methods has been uh, explored in, like for example, extending depth field by using pinhole type optics or very focal displays or multifocal displays or uh, Hedman holographic displays. And, but today I'm going to focus on the live field display approach. And I should mention that even though um, traditionally that I have been doing my research in the Hedman display and, and area, but the conclusion, some of the conclusion that I'm trying to draw today is applicable to direct view live field display as well. And to start the conversation, and so generally a true 3D live field display is aimed to render the light rays as you see from the different directions of these arrows and as if they are emitted from the point of interest. So um, we know that the array basically could be geometrically represented by two points on two separate planes. So therefore, typically, we represent the light field using the four-dimensional four function, and a one plane, UV plane, defines a 2D position, and another point on the ST plane defines a 2D direction. To use that concept to render 3D live field display, so for instance, in order to render the Rubik cube here, so what we're typically trying to do is trying to render the ray bundles by angularly presenting the different rays that represent the different directions emitted from the point of interest, for example, from that point. So when your eyes are focusing at the tip of the, the cube, and that all the rays from that point is going to converge and form a sharp pixel. And if, the, if your eye is accommodated at that distance, then the, the light rays from other points will form a blur on your retina, obviously. So that's kind of the methodology for a live field display. Um, in terms of the optical architecture used for HMD, there are commonly known as two different architecture. One is to use the integral imaging type of an approach, like the previous, some of the speakers this morning has talked about, you have a macro display and then you combine it with either a, a pinhole array or you have a lens lit array, and you can use them independently. Or earlier that we demonstrated, you can combine that with a freeform eyepiece or some other type of eyepiece to create an AR display that renders the true 3D live field. 
And uh, an alternative approach also kind of <laughs> described a little bit by the previous speaker was the multi-layer type. Instead of using a lens emitter array, so now you stack multiple layers of spatial and multi-layer. So basically, a pixels from two different layers define array direction. That's also obvious to understand. So, but as an optical engineer, that uh, we, when we're trying to design systems, we always think about how do we optimize it. So in this context, in order to render that light field, keep in mind in this case, we want the goal is to render the different ray directions that incident on your eye pupil. So you can see that subtle difference, directional difference. So therefore, your eye would be, this rays will give you enough information so your eye can focus at the correct distance. So we expect to have multiple samples enter your eye pupil. But the question is how many angular samples do you really need? And what's the, what's the trade-off between the number of samples versus the resolution and versus the level of the, all the quality of the focusing cue the display can render, right? So that's number one question. The second one is what are the metrics we can use to quantify the optical quality in this context and quantify the comfort, in this case, the quality of the focusing cue? And uh, lastly is what are the relationships between the sampling and the quality metrics? So that's uh, basically the objective of this talk and uh, I'm trying to uh, answer some of that question. So in order to do that, I want to point out that uh, this talk is based on an uh, Optics Express paper we recently published and if you, so the talk won't get into all the details of the, uh, the simulation and analysis. So if you want to know everything about this topic, go to that paper that has, a, is almost a 20 page paper to discuss the detail. So, but I want to start with, the, in order to fully understand the problem, that I, I was trying to answer. So we decided to build a simulation model. And so because I think that in order to characterize a live field display, it does not make sense without integrating the live field generation engine with the observer because um, half of the process happened on the retina, right? So there are many different, uh, different types of live field display have been built or demonstrated, but in general, they all fall into this sim simplified architecture I show you here. So most all the live field displays started with two planes. So in this case, I call one plane as a rendering plane. You can think of that's the plane where you render those elemental images. And then you oftentimes find a second plane I call modulation plane. That's where you start to generate the directional ray samples. And so in this case, typically those could be the lens layer ray layer, could it be the spatial light modulator, second spatial light modulator layer, and that's all. And then it oftentimes also is involve another plane which I call the central depth plane. And so what that means is basically that's, uh, you can think of the central depth plane is the optical conjugates of the rendering plane through the modulation plane. So if this is a lens light array, there's an image and conjugation between the rendering plane and the central depth plane. And if, if this is simply a, a pinhole array, so this is, uh, you can think of that as the reference plane. There's no image in there, right? So the light coming out from the modulation plane, could it be collimated? In that case, the central depth plane is in, at infinity, or is converging. So it's at a definite distance. And so typically, the image formed on the central depth plane would be the highest resolution you can possibly create in your 3D system. And then another plane here I call the reconstruction plane. That's also easy to understand, that's the, the depth of interest that you're trying to render a 3D point. So for example, if you're trying to render P point, and that will be your reconstruction plane. And then the last component in the light field engine is your view, view window. So that's obviously, that's where you place your eye. And then at the second part of the model, I put the eye model into the system. And we use the Arizona eye model that allows us to change the eye accommodation and all the, all the op other optical properties of the human eye. So as you can see, 
For example, in order to render the point P, I use four elemental views, and then four elemental views propagate through and uh, project four dots on the central depth plane, and they continue the go for life field renderings. You want the chief rays of all the elemental views across at the point of your interest. So therefore, you create a point P. As the point continue propagate, the light continue propagates, and the, each of the you project four footprints on your pupil. And then that four views, if your eye happens to be accommodate at the distance of P, the point of interest, the four bundles of rays are going to overlap and create a, a fused light field image. And if your eye happens not accommodate at the point of P, but a different distance. For instance, in this case, uh, in this diagram is showing the eyes converged in front of the reconstruction plane. Then you see on the retina, the elemental views will be slightly laterally shifted from each other. And if the displacement is large, then the, the, the blob is large. And this is the case when your eye is accommodated behind the reconstruction plane. And so then in order to quantify the image formation process and the image properties of this, uh, this system, we define the point spread function of the perceived light field. We call it accumulated point spread function. Obviously, in this case, um, considering all the elemental views are spatially incoherent. So therefore, the PS of the light field PSF is basically an integral of the elemental view PSF. It's a, the square of the elemental view P PSF. And of course, I here I introduce a few nuanced uh, weighting factors to, uh, come to take into account some of the, um, um, the I properties. Um, for instance, the LMA, this is simple. This is basically the illuminance value for that particular elemental view. And then the W uh, weighting function is to weight the different wavelengths or different color channels in your system. And then the S is because the eye, the each of the view incident onto your eye pupil at a different location, there is a, the size Crawford effect to account for the efficiency. So that change kind of contributed to the weighting to the individual elemental view point spread function. But the most important thing is the elemental view point spread function. That turns out to be a very complex uh, point spread function because it depends on a lot of factors here. So for instance, one of the most important depending factor is the characteristics of the view samples. So the way that I characterize the view of the light field to make it generally applicable to any system, I define a parameter called the view density. Let's say you at any given time, you have n views enter your eye pupil and your eye pupil diameter is D, so the view density basically is defined as the number of views per unit area. So you, for any life you display, you can define that parameter, right? So the view density defines basically the view pitch information, and then the second parameter that is important is the fill factor of the life the life fuel system. So for instance, in the, on the left hand side, that indicates all the views are next to each other with no gap in between. And versus in this case, even though the view densities are the same, but this one has a smaller fill factor. So that's basically the fill factor characterizes the footprint size of each view on the eye pupil. So that's again is going to play a little bit on the diffraction aspects of your system. And another important factor in the system, uh, depending the PSF is depending on is the central depth plane location. So the central depth plane, as I mentioned, if the if the light coming out of each element of view collimated is at infinity, or if it's not, it's at different distance. So obviously, that PSF is going to propagate into your eye. That's a depending factor. And then the, the, the quality of the reconstruction also going to depend on the separation between the reconstruction distance and the CDP, the central depth plane. The further away, that uh, the reconstruction plane is deviated from the CDP, the more the focus you involved in your system. The last, uh, the last two components is the eye accommodation. As I already mentioned, the quality of the perceived light field point spread function depends on where your eye accommodated. 
So therefore, accommodation and then the pupil diameter, and of course that depends on the luminance and the other factors, but that depends how many views your eye sees at a given time. So without getting, trying to get into the mathematics in this talk, and the, the paper described the mathematics um, modeling of the PSF for the elemental views, but however, I want to give you a little bit of information directly related to uh, some of the conclusion. So one of the aspects we look at was what is the effect of view density on the CDP, on the spatial resolution, on the CDP first, because that's the highest resolution you can get. So what do you see? In this case, basically, there's no separation between reconstruction plan and the CDP. And so the different plots shows you the different view samples. So the blue one is a reference. That's where you only have one single view with a, the full pupil diameter. And versus the second one shows you have a two by two view, and then the last one shows you have four by four view, enters your eye pupil. So obviously, the higher the view density, the, the lower the modulation transfer function goes. This is primarily due to the diffraction effects because you have very small rebound that enters your eye now. And so that basically directly answers the question, it's not like the more views, the more better. There is a trade-off that you have to make. And the second aspect that I want to demonstrate is what is the effect of the uh, the, the resolution degradation and in relate to your reconstruction. So as I mentioned, the, the further away you move your reconstruction depth, you expect to see image degradation, but how much? So this, in this case, we simulated, this is give you an example of you have a two by two view arrangement and the field factor one, and the, the blue curve shows you the one that right on the CDP, and the yellowish one shows was shifted away by 0.9 diopters. And the CDP was set at uh, one diopter. So this basically, and we shifted that closer, so that's uh, um, about two diopter, 1.9 diopter, getting closer to your eye. And this is an imagery simulation. So the, the three sets of letters, one Archimedes, two Archimedes, three Archimedes. In this case, of course, we are assuming in the simulation, the Elemental views, the rendering plane has infinite pixel resolution. So therefore, you see the nice image here. But uh, the point you want to see is at a point 0.9 diopter shift, you won't be able to see the one Archimedes anymore. That was uh, predicted uh, from here already. Right. And so based on the how the resolution change, we start looking at what is the effect of view density on depth field, right? So we define cutoff frequency. Basically, you set up your threshold modulation values, and then you define what is the highest possible spatial resolution the display can render, and we define the cutoff frequency from there. And so the, the main thing that you take home is the vertical direction, the cutoff fre frequency, the horizontal is the amount of depth field. And so then these are different plots are showing for different view density. If you just quickly like look at like the 2.2 .2 views, you see your highest spatial frequency is roughly about 35 dub cycles per degree, and then gradually degrade if you shift it away by one diopter. Versus if you have three by three views, you virtually see no change, but then the highest resolution you can get is 25 cycles per degree. And so the other aspect we're trying to quantify was the level, the quality of the blurring cue, which is the, actually the blurring cue is a, so the only stimulus to stimulate your eye to accommodate at a different, the right distance. So without getting into the details of that, I would just want to show you a, a quick a re result of it. So the effects of the view density on the accommodation error. So basically, even though you rendered at the correct distance, your eye not necessarily accommodate at the distance you want the eye accommodate. So the, the two we're showing was for different view densities. This one is on the CDP. This one was shifted away by uh, one diopter. And as you can see, the, the, the black mark basically shows where is the highest image contrast, and your eye will seek for that highest image contrast and the overlaid with your rendering depth. And if the black mark is shifted away, that indicates the uh, accommodation error. And so the, as you can see for the, 
for the two by two views on the CDP, no problem. But uh, when you have a depth shift at the reconstruction, different depth, you start to see accommodation error. And there are more details in the paper to show you the different the, the other sampling effects. But in quick conclusion, in, in, the, in terms of sampling guidelines, the, I recommend a view density two by two or three by three. If there's a trade-off, for example, two by two views can afford the display to achieve highest spatial resolution 0.85 arc minutes and give you a small, a relatively small depth of field and a, a very small accommodation error. Our three by three views afford a lower spatial resolution, a larger depth of field and uh, reasonable. Of course, the uh, two by two views give you a higher image contrast than the three by three views. If you go more than beyond the three by three, I don't see much benefit there. And so we, we developed a system recently trying to demonstrate some of the properties. And so they quickly, the system has a macro lens lid array, a construction had a, a tunable lens that allow us to control the CDP position. And then we have the eyepiece. And one quickly, they, we integrated a lens and aperture array to remove the cross, typical crosstalk in a integral imaging system. And the optical system, it's because more complex than that. So the, and quickly go through that. This is the macro integral I image unit. There was the tunable lens relay group. And then this is a fixed eyepiece. This was the prototype. And this is in the example where the CDP was fixed at one diopter, and we rendered three resolution targets at one at three diopter, one another one at 0.5 diopter, one front, one behind from, from the CDP. And this is when the camera was focused on the, C, on the CDP versus when the camera is focused on the 0.5 diopter target or the, when the camera is focused on the three diopter target. And you can see clearly that uh, the resolution, this is a three arc minutes, six arc minutes, nine arc minutes. In this case, the display native cutoff frequency was a three arc minutes. You can see the three arc minutes letters. But then once you go here, you won't be able to see that at all. And then the effects of if you're trying to switch your CDP to three diopters, now you can clearly, with the camera is focused on the three diopter, you can see the three arc minutes standard letters perfectly fine. And this is a comparison when your CDP is at one diopter, then you obviously lose the resolution even though that your camera is focusing on it. And so in summary, that I presented a generalized model for 3D light field displays, which can be adapted to different types of light field generation architecture and allows you to quantify the image quality and accommodation errors. And then we, we, uh, we basically apply that to optimize light field head mount displays to uh, enable us balance between quality and comfort. I presented the sampling guidelines, and, I, and then in the end, I quickly show you a recent results. That's all. And uh, this is acknowledged to my students. And I should point out uh, Hu Kun, he's the one who did all the work behind. That's all. <laughs>